In the old days, men tried to catch a glimpse of the future in the strangest of ways. They locked themselves in dark rooms, not partaking of food and drink. At the stroke of midnight, they ventured out into the night, through the dark woods, where strange creatures roamed. To see if they would be wealthy, to see if they would be happy, to see if they would live, to see if they would, would be loved. They are very far away. So there... Is there something? No. Oh, hello. There you are. I've been waiting for you all day. Not go outside without a head in a cold day like this. You will freeze your, your ears off. And I'm quite fond of the person those ears belong to. Did anyone see you coming here? Now you're being silly. You know that I'm not ashamed of you. It's not that. I like you very much. But you and I come from different worlds. He's waiting for my answer. I said I'd give it to him next year. And this is the last day of this year. Now you're being unfair. This isn't any easier for me. I don't like it when you're like this. Calm down. You're walking? I hope you're joking. No, I'm not joking. Do you remember what happened to my cousin, don't you? Promise me you won't do anything foolish. We're not supposed to know what happens in the future. You should hurry home to your cottage and get some rest. Alright. Getting some rest. Now we move back. Yeah. Back at my cottage. Asgang Yearwalk. Yearwalking was at its core a vision quest with the purpose being to foresee the future. There were very rigid rules concerning the Yearwalk and not adhering to them could prove very dangerous, even fatal. How the practice of Yearwalking came to be is shrouded in mystery, but it seems to have been a widespread practice in Sweden until the beginning of the 19th century and in some rural areas as late as the beginning of the 20th century. The practice was likely over a thousand years old, and most certainly pagan. Yearwalking varied greatly regionally and even locally, there might have been differences 
differences between one village and the next. All the variations had a couple of elements in the common dough. A year work could not be done on any common day. There were certain days, a year when the gate was opened, generally in liaison with important festival days such as May Day, Midsummer's Eve or Christmas Eve, and most commonly New Year's Eve. A year worker could not partake of, uh, of any of the food or drinks that were served on these days, a sacrifice of no little signific significance since these feasts were some of the rare occasions when food would be plentiful and rare. Right. A year worker had to avoid other people, so they commonly locked themselves in dark rooms and were not allowed to see a fire for the entire day. Perhaps not the vast sacrifice on Midsummer's Eve, but on cold winter days it would be uncomfort uncomfortable at least, if not hazardous. If the year worker followed these steps he would leave his dark room at the stroke of midnight. This would be his last chance to cancel the year work. Once he ventured out there, there was no turning back. The church was the final destination for a year worker. On his way he would typically encounter a number of supernatural creatures which would pose a threat physically, mentally and spiritually. If a year worker made it into the cemetery, he would walk around the church in an integrate pattern. This would open the year worker's eyes to the future, but it would also lure out the church grim. After having completed the year work, the worker would see visions that could manifest himself in different manners. When the year worker left the cemetery, he might for instance see a somber procession of dancers dressed in their finest church clothes. These would be people that would die the following year. A reoccurring theme is of course the year worker who meets his own ghost on the road. Another story tells of how the worker would see newly dug graves. Love played a great part too, so a worker would typically meet wedding processions or even attend weddings yet to come. One testimony from the late 19th century tells of a mental patient named Martin Nielsen who described his visions at as otherworldly experiences. Before I saw what happened next year, I lived among the stars. I lived there for many lifetimes, it seemed. What do I care for next year? Time has already ended. Today the practice seems to be almost entirely forgotten. Let's find our way. Ah, oh, the symbol here. Huh? It's with one eye. This uh, rune. Uh, here's the horse. The horse sign. Here's nothing in this cave. Uh, we have to go all the way to the right and then up. Left. Oh, there's nothing here. What's this? Mm. Ah, left, right. What are these signs on the wood? Like kobolds. Oh. Now it's all bloody. I 
no, here's a gate. Here's a gate, oh. It's a key. Who's this lady? Yeah, that woman. Maybe we have something in the encyclopedia. The Hultra. Skox Grayet. The Hultra is known to have played a part in Norse mythology, but she is likely of an even older origin from from when men lived off the forest rather than the fields. The Huldra was the guardian of the forest. She tended to the trees, plants and animals. A single large tree in a grove surrounded by smaller trees was often considered to be the Huldra's home, or even the Huldra herself. In most stories she presented herself as a beautiful young woman. This was however not her real appearance. Very few saw the Huldra's two face, and even fewer lived to speak of it. She was often described as a lonely and woe-filled creature. Her relationship with humans was very complex. She could enthrall a man with her beautiful song and lure him deeper and deeper into the forest, where she either wedded or killed him. The man kissed by the Huldra became apathetic and slow. According to some accounts, the Huldra was a positive force. If a hunter was kind to the Huldra, she might blow her brief down the barrel of his rifle, which would bless his hunt. Colliers considered her their friend, as she kept fires from speeding from their charcoal kiln. She also helped those who willingly offered their blood to her, but this was dangerous as the Huldra might drink the giver dry. The Huldra was thus capable of doing both good and bad deeds. It was very hard to predict whether she would help or harm, since she played by rules known only to her. Hmm. We hear the song? We knew. We have to find her. I can he hear her. We have to follow her song. It's getting louder. It's ah. Here we take note of the sign here. Ah, we are very near now. Oh. There she is. And now? We have to follow her? It's a half a tree and half a woman. The whole draw. Where sh where will she lead us to? I mean, she's capable of good and bad deeds. We better pray. Oh. Ah, she, she created a way for us. Where does it lead to? To the dead tree. Alright. There were two oils. She's now in the tree. Wait, this is a little puppet, I think. Okay. So what's what's the order of the puppet's arms moving? Left. Left, right, I already have. Then left, right, 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 left, left. The tree. 
tree opens for us. What is in there? Gosh. <sighs> what the fuck? I thought uh, she would be nice to us. Oh, good and bad side. Did she only want to do us uh, to our own death? But the dead tree is not dead anymore. We got the key to the church. Yeah. So the key the disappeared and vanished into water or something. Ah uh, here. This is like a river here, the brook. Brook wet tops beckon. Wet tops beckon, we have to go there. Like Move down. Ah, I can hear the water flowing. But where's the key? You hear this? Oh What's god. This? Is this the key? It's a horse. Huh? We just read about it. He has the key for us? What is this? The ghost from children. We look this up. Mealing in the mining. Some milings died at the hands of angel makers. The angel maker would typically be paid by the child's poor mother to find a decent home for the infant. When the mother left, the infant was murdered. Typically, the milings were murdered by their mothers, often unmarried women who had been left to fend for themselves. The miling would commonly be left in the woods to die, or they would have been drowned by their mothers in brooks or bogs. Some milings died at the hands of angel makers. 
The angel maker would typically be paid by the child's poor mother to find a decent home for the infant. You just read this? Why the text is like repeating here? The most common way for the mining to haunt was through a horrible wailing sound. The mining might take the form of ball of light similar to those of an ear blossom. Scandinavian willow the wisp and lead the curious traveler astray. Sometimes they would cry for their mothers to priest feed them which would apparently set them free. One story from Baslaken tells of an old farmer on his way home to the forest. He is approached by a small child who follows him and says, Grandfather, Grandfather, I am so hungry. The old man tries to ignore it, but the child keeps on nagging. So finally the old man loses his patience. If you can find someone to feed you, then feed. But you won't get any milk from me. The child seems pleased and leaves. When the old man comes home, he finds his daughter lying dead on the floor, bleeding from her chest. The child he met was the spirit of his murdered grandson. A person who helped the Milings find their way to the other side was often left with a gift. According to some sources, the Miling would be taken in by other supernatural creatures such as Hobbs, or if it had been drowned, the Brook Horse. So that's okay. the Brook Horse. That is the Brook Horse, yeah. Becker has the Brook Horse. Sweden is a country that has a lot of lakes, rivers, streams and brooks, and Swedish folklore is filled with strange creatures residing in the dark waters. The Brook Horse was a pale horse who lived in creeks or lakes, luring children to ride on its back. The Brook Horse spine grew for every rider that it lured on top of its back. When the Brook Horse was satisfied, it leaped into the water whereupon the children drowned. The Brook Horse had a lot in common with the Nix, a handsome young fiddler who lured young girls down into the water, and according to some, they were one and the same. It's likely that the Brook Horse was made up to keep children from playing too close to the water. One of the more unusual descriptions comes from a story told in the north of Dalana. A young man is on his way home from his work at a charcoal kiln. He decides to wash up up in a nearby creek. The man finds a strange stone, formed like a small child in the water. He picks it up. The man notices that he, that he is not alone. He is being watched by a horse, walking on two legs. The horse stretches out a human hand to the man who gets frightened and runs home to a check he chairs with his fellow workers. He tells the tale to his comrades, who laugh at him and call him a drunken fool. He shows them the stone that now looks quite ordinary. The man curses and goes to bed. When the workers wake up the following morgen, morning, they find the man dead in his bed, his lungs filled with water and the stone nowhere to be seen. The brook horse was almost always closely associated with death, not always in a negative way. For instance, in the sad folk till Neil Niels, the brook horse is, is the one who finally leads little Neil's soul home and thus ends this long series of misfortunes.